find in Talbot Saturn. People ask me <clears throat> often, what do you think about our situation? And I say, I think about what I know. What does that mean? Good question. It means in New York, what we've been doing is we follow the facts, we follow the data, we follow the science, we focus on what we know uh, and the facts that we know, and we make our decisions based on the facts. So uh, every morning we look at the facts. Facts today are that the hospitalization rate dropped once again, which is very good news. The total hospital hospitalization rate has dropped. The intubation rate has dropped. The number of new cases per day has dropped, down to 572, and those are new cases, people who walk in the door of a hospital or people who are in a hospital and uh, test positive. But that's down to 572. You see, it hasn't been that level since uh, we started back March 20, March 21. So that is, that is welcome news. This is not welcome news. And uh, this has been heartbreaking every day. 226 deaths, 226 families. And you see how that number has been uh, infuriatingly constant. 226 is where we were five days ago. So we would like to see that number dropping uh, at a far faster rate than it has been dropping. And these are 226 people who lost their lives despite everything our healthcare system could do, right? That's despite the best hospital care, the best nursing, the best doctors, the best equipment. Uh, so it's, there are people who we know we made every effort possible to save. And to the extent there's some peace in that, uh, then we're looking for peace wherever we can. The priority for us today is uh, dealing with a new issue that has come up, which is truly disturbing. And that is the issue on how the COVID virus may affect uh, young people, very young people, infants, children in elementary school. We had thought initially, and again, so many of what the initial information we had turned out not to be correct or turned out to be modified. Uh, but we were laboring under the impression that young people were not affected by COVID-19. And that was actually good news, right? The vulnerable populations were older people, people with comorbidities. but. The, uh, one of the few rays of good news was young people weren't affected. We're not so sure that that is the fact anymore. Uh, toddler elementary school children are presenting symptoms similar to Kawasaki disease or toxic shock-like syndrome. Now, these are children who come in who don't present the uh, symptoms that we normally are familiar with with COVID. It's not a respiratory illness. They're not in respiratory distress. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this may be getting discovered uh, this far into the process. It's more an inflama inflammation of the blood vessels, which can then cause problems with their heart. And there are 73 cases that the Department of Health, Dr. Zucker, is now studying. Uh, but the illness has taken the lives of three young New Yorkers. So this is new, and it's developing. Uh, the Department of Health has communicated with the federal officials, the CDC. And the CDC has asked New York to develop national criteria for this 
so that other states, other hospital systems can also be checking into this and looking into this. Again, uh, as it turns out, these children happen to have the COVID antibodies or be positive for COVID, but those were not the symptoms they showed when they came in to the hospital system. Uh, so it's still very much a situation that is developing, but it is a serious situation. The Department of Health is also going to be working with the New York Genome Center and Rockefeller University to conduct a genome and RNA sequencing study to see if there's something about these children that may present uh, a definable situation. But uh, rest assured, the Department of Health is on top of it. This is the last thing that we need at this time with all that's going on, with all the anxiety we have. Uh, now, for parents to have to worry about whether or not their youngster was infected. Uh, and again, symptoms that don't even seem uh, like the symptoms we associate with COVID-19. So we still have a lot to learn about this virus. And uh, every day is another eye-opening situation. But uh, rest assured, the Department of Health is doing everything that they can do. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the New York State Department of Health uh, is the first one that has been on this situation. And again, working with the CDC and whatever we find out, we'll not only share with the public, but we'll also share with other states and other hospital systems. Uh, because it is very possible that uh, this has been going on for several weeks and uh, it hasn't been diagnosed as related to COVID. Uh, so again, we'll keep you updated. I know many people are concerned about that uh, as they should be. A priority that we've been working on uh, throughout has been protecting our frontline workers. We're very aware of the sacrifices that our frontline workers are making so uh, so many of us can stay home and stay safe and we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to protect our frontline workers. We've been working with the healthcare workers, police officers, firefighters, EMT, and our transit workers. Uh, in New York, we have to keep the public transit system operating. That's how many essential workers, frontline workers, get to work. If we got to a situation where we had to close down public transit, our hospital system would have suffered. Uh, that's how nurses get there. That's how the hospital staff gets there. But our transit workers had to operate that transit system right in the midst of this COVID virus, and it never stopped. Uh, bus operators, train operators, the station cleaners. So while everyone uh, was trying to get home, trying to stay safe, they were showing up for, for work every day to make sure that the people who didn't need to go to work could get to work. We've already conducted the largest antibody test in the country, 15,000 people in that sample. What the antibody test tells you is who has been infected by the virus and then has the antibodies as they recover. Uh, and that gives us a baseline, that 15,000 survey statewide, to compare other groups against. So we know what the uh, average infection rate is in different parts of the state. We can then compare groups to that baseline. We recently tested the transit workers. Uh, writ large who have been doing the operations of the transit system. We tested 1,300, so that's a, a large size sample. 14% was the infection rate among transit workers, and that's uh, actually good news. We'd like to see zero, but 14% is below the average infection rate for New Yorkers, so it means that the transit workers' infection rate is uh, below the norm for New York City. Within the transit workers, it's a little higher with station workers than with bus operators or uh, train conductors, assistant conductors, but uh, all categories are below the New York City norm. Uh, the New York City norm was 19.9, so that is, that is good news. And that also affirms the news we've heard on the other essential workers, frontline workers, our healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, we were afraid that 
because they were literally in the emergency rooms, they'd have a higher infection rate. But it uh, turns out that's not true. 12% was the <laughs> infection rate among those workers. It shows that the PPE works when we talk about masks and gloves, et cetera. It's not that uh, nurses and doctors in those emergency rooms have uh, fancier equipment and more sophisticated equipment. This is the same type of mask that they wear. So it works. Uh, New York Police Department had an infection rate of 10%. Fire Department and EMT had an infection rate of 17%, which is the highest of all those groups. We think it's higher because of the EMT workers, uh, but again, all <coughs> below the New York City uh, rate of 19.9. Another issue that we've been aware of and we're working on is the fact that poor and minority communities are suffering most the numbers in this state are not nearly as bad as the disparity in any other, in many other states, but any disparity is bad, uh, and that's what we have been focusing on here. We uh, did surveys and data that show if you look at the 21 zip codes with the highest number of hospitalizations for COVID, 20 of those 21 have greater than average African American or Latino populations. 20 of 21 of those zip codes. So there's no doubt that it is a problem. And you can, we've mapped this and you can see exactly where uh, people are coming from as they're walking into hospitals. Part of the new system that we've implemented through this is hospitals report nightly how many cases they have, where they come from, and we can now literally map the number of people and where they're coming from throughout the state. Uh, and then when you look into uh, that information, especially in Brooklyn and the Bronx, it's clear that uh, the communities are heavier minority population and heavier low-income population. And when you compare that with the overall city rate, it makes the same point. point. That hospitalization rate, infection rate among the minority community, among lower income communities, is higher than the average. Uh, unfortunately, in a cruel irony, this is often the case. When you look at disasters, emergencies, I don't care if they're hurricanes, floods, whatever they are, uh, cruel irony is the poorest people pay the highest price. I've seen this across the country when I was at HUD. Uh, you're there to take care of a flood or a storm. It's the poorer communities that get wiped out first, right? It's the lowland. It's the land that tends to flood that has the lower value. And that's where the lower community, lower income community tends to locate. Uh, so uh, we understand why, we understand the health disparities, we understand comorbidities, but we also understand it's just not right. It is just not right. And uh, we have to address it. We saw the same thing in Hurricane Katrina. Those people who were on rooftops were not, not the wealthy white part of the community. They were predominantly minority. They were predominantly low income. Those rooftops very often were public housing. So this has been the pattern. Flint, Michigan, the people who were drinking water that was poisoned, they were low income minority populations. If you even go back to 1927, the great Mississippi flood, where there's a Mississippi, Mississippi flood, it floods the lowlands. It floods lower income communities. Uh, we get it, but we have to break the cycle. New York, we're going right at uh, finding the reasons for the disparity and resolving them. We are doing more testing in low-income communities and communities of color. We're doing testing in public housing aggressively, <coughs> excuse me, partnering with Ready Responders, uh, which is a group which is doing great work. We've delivered PPE equipment, masks, over one million, hand sanitizer, et cetera, to public housing. And today, we're launching a new initiative, again, to address exactly this, which is to expand access to testing in low-income communities 
and communities of color. Uh, we're partnering with Northwell Health, which is the largest health system in New York, uh, and they're going to set up 22 additional testing sites at churches in predominantly minority communities. This is uh, a different kind of partnership. It's a creative, but it's, it's necessary. Uh, we're working with both churches individually and association of churches and Northwell. Northwell will provide the testing in churches in uh, lower income communities and communities of color. The churches will help us outreach to the community to get people to come in and explain why it's important that people come in and get tested, and Northwell uh, will do the testing. We have 24 sites uh, in the New York City area. Some will be opening the week of May 12th. Uh, some will be opening the second week of May 19th. But uh, you see the coverage when we add the uh, network of churches is very broad again, focused on these communities that we want to reach out to. Uh, these 24 new sites will be working with the current network of sites, and we've already located many testing sites in minority communities and low-income communities. Uh, but when you put the church-based sites together with the drive-through sites, together with the walk-in testing sites, and our sites at public housing, the coverage will be extensive. So the sites will be there. We now need New Yorkers to go get the tests. And I know, you know, I do this with people all day long. Uh, I feel fine, I feel fine. You can feel fine and test positive for COVID. You can, you can be asymptomatic and still have the COVID virus. Well, if I feel fine, what's the difference? Because you can give it to someone else who will not feel fine. And you can give it to a person who's more in a vulnerable community uh, uh, group, older person, a person with an underlying illness, and they could be in serious trouble. So you want to know if you have it, not just for yourself, but so you don't communicate it to anyone else. Uh, I want to thank uh, our partners who are been working on this. It's exactly what we want to do all through this situation. We said we don't want to just deal with this virus. We don't want to just replace what was there. We actually want to make sure that we build back better than before. I understand that this inequity, this disparity exists. I understand it's existed for decades. I understand it exists all across the country, uh, but not New York, not New York. It shouldn't be here. I want to thank our congressional leaders who are partners in this effort, uh, who have been very instrumental in organizing the churches and putting it together with Northwell Health, especially Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez and Congresswoman Yvette Clark from Brooklyn and uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, who we're going to hear from in a moment. I also want to thank uh, the church groups this is not in the normal line of business for churches to be setting up testing sites for a COVID virus. But uh, I think it is the mission of the churches. They're there to serve the community. They're there to work with the community and meet the needs at that time. And this is the need at that time. Uh, so they've been extraordinarily helpful and cooperative. I also especially want to thank Reverend Rivera and Reverend David Brawley uh, for coming up with the idea and then working with the other groups to get them to uh, all participate. So uh, we've never done anything like this before, but there are a lot of firsts for all of us in this situation. So I want to thank them very much for what they're doing here. Uh, and it's my pleasure to announce that we're being joined with Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, who is a personal friend of mine. He's a great star for the state of New York in Washington. His voice, his leadership has been pivotal, not just for, for New York, but for the entire nation. 
And this is a time when we need the federal government to actually work and work well and work efficiently and work effectively and work for the people, which uh, sometimes doesn't happen in uh, Washington. And the people, the police, the firefighters, the people of this state couldn't have a better, more powerful advocate than Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Uh, and the congressman uh, worked tirelessly to put together this arrangement that we're announcing today with the churches. Again, it is a different type of partnership, uh, but uh, we do what we have to do in New York, and the congressman saw the need, and he reached out to the church groups and brought them together to, to be where we are today. Congressman, thank you so much uh, for everything you do, but especially thank you for what you did uh, to bring these church groups together with Northwell so we could announce this initiative. Congressman, good to be with you. Good morning, uh, Governor. Great to be with you. And of course, thank you for uh, the tremendous leadership that you have provided uh, to the people of the Empire State and, in fact, the nation uh, in so many ways during this moment of trial and tribulation. Uh, and I just appreciate the fact that your leadership has been evidence based, data driven, compassionate, and comprehensive. And today's announcement is just another example of that. We know uh, that this is an extraordinary pandemic and it requires an extraordinary governmental response uh, at all levels of government. It's all hands on deck uh, at the city, the state, and the federal level. Uh, and the New York delegation is committed to continuing to work with you to make sure that we can drive the federal resources into New York State to match the level of infection, pain, suffering, and death uh, that we've all had to endure. Uh, it's an all of government moment and of course an all of America moment as you've encouraged all of us uh, to dig deeper here in New York and, and throughout. And in that spirit, we know that the houses of worship, the spiritual community has always been there to help the community get through a storm. Uh, these churches have been there through the crack cocaine epidemic to welcome people in uh, while others were rejecting them. Uh, our churches have been there, for instance, to address the high rates of gun violence in our community through gun buyback programs, taking thousands of guns off the streets in their congregation buildings. Uh, and we also know that these houses of worship, our churches, our spiritual leaders have been there to partner with the state and with law enforcement uh, organizations like the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office through Begin Again initiatives to address old warrants and summons and citations that can impact the ability of people from communities of color to be able to get all of the opportunities to benefit from our full economy. And so now at this moment, uh, thanks to their continued engagement and your leadership and willingness to partner, uh, we can address this COVID-19 pandemic with these houses of worship and religious leaders who have the credibility, the authenticity, and the capacity to reach those in the community who need to be tested. Uh, because at the end of the day, this is not over for any of us until it's over for all of us. And as you've indicated, we know that communities of color have been hit particularly hard. We are disproportionately overrepresented amongst our essential frontline workers live in dense environments and have historically been under resourced throughout the nation. Uh, and so this testing initiative uh, will be incredibly essential into ensuring that we can turn the corner in communities of color, such as those that I represent, as well as those represented, of course, by great members of the delegation like Nydia Velasquez, Yvette Clark, Greg Meeks, Adriano Espaillat, and so many others. Uh, so thank you, Governor. Uh, for your partnership. I thank EBC and the other church coalitions for their initiative uh, and willingness to do what is necessary for us to confront this storm. The scripture says, uh, weeping may endure during the long night, but joy will come in the morning. And I'm thankful for your leadership, Governor Cuomo, thankful for the partnership with our houses of worship. And we're all gonna be there with the community 
until it's morning time in the United States of America once again. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Congressman. So well said. Uh, some people say, well, churches are closed. No, churches are open. Churches never close. And they're, they're doing their work and they're performing their mission. And Congressman, big week for you. Uh, what you're doing in Washington is so important to all of us. Uh, this legislation uh, that may be passed by Washington, uh, getting this country the aid they need, getting this state the aid we need. Uh, passed legislation did great for small businesses, et cetera. But I know your priority now is to bring funding for working New Yorkers, working Americans, the police, the firefighters, the health care uh, that have gotten us through this. Uh, making sure the state governments can function so we can do the reopening. And uh, we could not have a better voice. We couldn't have a stronger voice, a more capable voice uh, than yours and our delegation fighting for us and for the nation. You make the case for New York. You're making the case for America because we are just a microcosm of New York. Uh, we did get hardest hit in the number of cases, but you you address the need here, you address the need in America. And we know you can do it. God bless you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Congressman Jeffries. Thank you, God. God bless you. Thanks. That's our congressional delegation, representing all New Yorkers who are tough, smart, united, disciplined, and loving. Questions? Yes, question about you and your fellow northern governors. You have a cooperative regional approach. Does that change at all if Connecticut on the 20th has restaurants open so that Stanford is open but White Plains is not? And if in New Jersey you've got some of the beaches open, I know that's them and we're us. But how does that make you feel? Uh, it makes me feel fine. It's a lot that doesn't make me feel fine, but that I'm fine with. Uh, we said from the get-go, we all have slightly different situations. Uh, we talk about numbers. The numbers are slightly different in all these areas. Numbers are different within the state of New York, right? We have upstate, we have downstate. So you have a strategy that works based on the facts in that area. We said we have to coordinate states because what one state does, by definition, impacts other states. That doesn't mean necessarily, Dave, we have to do the same thing. But it does mean we should know what each other is doing before we do it so we can coordinate and discuss it. Uh, I understand Governor Lamont in Connecticut uh, and Governor Murphy in New Jersey. Those are the two closest states, obviously. But we're working with the entire Northeast. But we're in total lockstep. Uh, I know what they're doing. It makes sense uh, to me. It's not my decision. But their actions make sense to me. And we will coordinate with that, and we're aware of it. Doesn't mean we necessarily do the same thing, uh, but we are coordinating what they're doing, what we're doing, so we're not counterproductive to anyone else. You know, I've had situations in the state in the past where we weren't even coordinated, like New York City versus Long Island versus Westchester, and one area would do something that would affect the other area and nobody even knew so this state is coordinated like never before and that's worked to our benefit and we're coordinating with the other states but they will have slightly different strategies in all of it and we talk through everything we have a great personal relationship and professional relationship we talk through everything before we do it do you tell them you might get a flood of new yorkers do you say hey you know you yeah, can do we, it but... we discuss that all the time the mobility in the region and mobility in the region and a demand that you have never seen before. Never seen before. I said uh, up in Albany, I am a Queens boy, but I w was in Albany, and there's a car with two people eating from styrofoam containers in a car, parked car. I'm passing by. Uh, they say hello. We chat. I said they were from Queens, New York, drove to Albany to buy Thai takeout food. I said, why would you drive from Queens? I said it nicely. But I said, why did you drive from Queens to buy Thai food? You know, you can buy Thai food in Queens. Uh, 
They said, well, we just wanted to take a ride. We had to get out of the house. Now, that's two and a half hours up, two and a half hours back to buy Thai food, right? Just look at that state of mind. Five hours in the car as a welcome <laughs> relief to staying home, right? So uh, we, we just saw it in the state of Georgia. Your people driving from out of state to get a haircut. They just wanted to get out. They wanted to see people. They wanted to move. So you have that demand, and we're very well aware. What Jersey does, what Connecticut does, what New York does is going to affect all of us. There will be mobility. Uh, we can't align every action, but we're aware of it, and we're monitoring it. And by the way, if it becomes a problem, then we'll adjust it. You know, anyone who tells you they know the script here uh, doesn't know what they're talking about. Nobody has done this before. But no, you haven't done it before. You, you take an action on the best information you have, and then you see what happens. If Connecticut or Jersey does something, and you get a flood of New Yorkers going there, we'll adjust. They'll adjust, we'll adjust. If I do something that brings New Jersey and Connecticut people here, I'll adjust, right? So. It's not that every move you make is going to be perfect, but uh, stay on the balls of your feet, be ready to adjust, be ready to move, and if something happens, then shift. FDR, right? Bold experimentation. Don't be afraid of doing something that might have a negative consequence, otherwise you just stay frozen in place. Uh, but if there is a negative, be ready to move right away, and we are. Carol? Yeah. First on the funding, my point to the congressman, everything is dependent, Carol, on whether or not we get federal funding. We have like a $13 billion hole in the state, financial hole. Uh, $13 billion, there is no way the state can manage a $13 billion hole. And we had nothing to do with it. It was all COVID-related. COVID closed down the economy, hurts everybody, hurts the state revenues. It is going to be wholly dependent on what Washington does. And this week, I hope finally, the federal government actually passes a piece of legislation that helps the states. They've been taking care of small business, hotels, restaurants, airlines. That's great. How about the working people of this country, right? Uh, not just the corporations, but the working people. And funding a state government is a way of funding the working people. When you fund the state, I fund substance abuse programs, police, firefighters, hospitals, schools, school teachers, remote learning. That all comes from the state. Uh, so it's, it's a function of what the federal government does. In terms of the underlying substance abuse problem, we have seen an increase in mental health issues all through this period. Anxiety, stress, economic stress, stress of personal relations, mental health issues have gone up, domestic violence has gone up, substance abuse has gone up, alcohol-related illnesses has gone up. This has been a highly stressful period all across the board. We've done mental health outreach uh, in a way we've never done it before. We have like 40,000 mental health volunteers doing online mental health services, uh, alcohol-related services, substance abuse services. But there is no doubt that one of the manifestations of the stress has been substance abuse, domestic violence, alcoholism. There's no doubt about that. They were hurting a lot of the community-based programs before COVID, and now they're running out of money. Yeah. Look, if it, if it works the way it should, Washington and the federal government actually does the right thing, or even if they do close to the responsible thing, 
how can they possibly ignore state governments, working families, working uh, Americans, as, as bizarre as the federal government is at times? I cannot believe they would turn their back on working Americans at this time. Well, let me put it this way. I can believe it, because I can believe anything that they do, but uh, I don't believe they will do that. I don't believe the Congress will let them do that. I don't believe the House will let them do that. Um, I just have a question about, um, there's, there has been reports of um, homeless people coming off the subways after the shutdown at uh, 1 a.m. over this weekend, it was cold, uh, coming off the subways and just going into the buses that are standing outside the uh, end stations. Um, for example, you know, Stillwell Avenue, Coney Island, uh, there was one bus with 16 homeless people, no heat, um, they were all just in there. Um, how, you know, what is the city planning to do about, you know, the homeless people coming off the subways after the shutdowns and yeah. getting on the bus? Look, this is, uh, this is an important topic. We shut down the subways for four hours per night. First time the New York City subway system has ever been shut down. Why? Because we have to disinfect it. We've never disinfected a train. We've never disinfected a bus. Uh, we've never even contemplated disinfecting a public transportation system before. When I said this, this is all new, these are all firsts. But we want the frontline workers to go to work. I feel a special personal obligation, frankly, to protect the frontline workers. Because remember what I wound up saying, the words that came out of my mouth? I said to New Yorkers, take this very seriously. The COVID virus can be deadly. Stay home. It's not a joke. That's why we closed businesses, schools, et cetera. The second message was, but frontline workers, we still need you to go to work the next day. What do you mean you need me to go to work? You just said it's dangerous, you're closing everything, but I have to go to work? Yes, you have to go to work because we need you in the hospitals. And because we need people in hospitals, uh, we need people to operate the transit system. Uh, and we need food, so we need food delivery workers, and we need grocery store workers, so we need all these essential workers to work so other people can stay home. How is that fair? Some people get to stay home, but the frontline workers have to go to work. I get it. So I said, we will do everything we need to do. They're taking the subway system. The COVID virus can live on a stainless steel surface for two or three days, okay? You look in a subway car, you see all those stainless steel poles. I said, we owe it to them to disinfect the trains, which had never been done. Okay, so we close the train four hours, and we go and we disinfect, and the transit workers are doing fen a phenomenal job. They have this new disinfecting equipment, electrostatic machines. They're really doing a fantastic job. If you look at the trains now, they're cleaner than they have probably been in decades. A related issue was to disinfect the trains, you have to get all the passengers off the trains which then brought you into, there are homeless people who ride the trains all night, uh, have been for decades, it's much worse now, and the homeless people need to come off the train so you can disinfect the train. That's actually an opportunity. I've worked on the issue of homelessness since I was in my 20s. I ran a not-for-profit, I built housing, I provided services, I was HUD secretary, I did homeless programs all across the nation. It gives you an opportunity to actually engage homeless people to get them off the trains and get them the help they need. Society does nobody a favor saying, we're going to let you sleep on a train all night. That's not right. It's not humane. It's not decent. Well, it's hard to get the homeless off the trains. Okay, but now we had to. And it gives you an opportunity to engage them, to get them into a shelter, get them into services, because nobody wants them spending their lives in a dangerous situation sleeping on a train. 
Transit says 2,000 homeless were taken off the trains. 2,000. I mean, just think of that number. Great. So now you have an opportunity to reach out to 2,000 people to get them into shelter and get them into services. And that is the point, an ancillary point, it wasn't the primary point, but as long as the homeless have to get off the trains, reach out to them, bring them into shelters, connect them with services, and I think that's an added bonus. Sir. Governor, should workers who leave their jobs because of COVID safety concerns be eligible for unemployment benefits? It's up to the federal law, and uh, I can check. I believe the federal law covers it now. The whole unemployment program is basically covered by federal law. When we go through this, well, why do you ask uh, people to fill out forms? Why are you asking these questions? Why does your website ask these questions? Those are all federal requirements. You know, they passed the federal bill a couple of weeks ago that said, here are the benefits. They also said, and here are the caveats, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's all federal regulations. I can check that specifically, but I think that's covered. Sir? In the 15 weeks, Governor, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, the Jersey Shore businesses, uh, so I think Cape May County was one that submitted a plan to the Jersey governor for reopening. What do you say to those small businesses that rely on this summer season uh, coming up? Um, you know, for people to come, and then if we if we reopen Nassau, then New Jersey, then they're all going to flood to to Nassau, and then come from New Jersey, and vice versa. Yeah, that's the point uh, Dave was making: the coordination among the states. Because you're right, we have small businesses here, we have tourist destinations here, right? If Long Island doesn't open, right? If Patchogue and the the beach communities along Long Island don't open, you'll see those people go to the Jersey Shore. Uh, so those are the kinds of things we coordinate. Look, we take this week by week. I hope we're in a better position. And that's why we watch the numbers. I hope we're in a better position, because you're right. The tourist season is the money-making period for a whole sector of businesses all across the state. Downstate, Long Island, upstate, tourism is uh, one of the big job drivers, period. Uh, all those camps, all those lakes. So it's a very big deal all across the board. And then you're right, we do have to coordinate with the surrounding states because you can go to Long Island or you can go to the uh, Jersey Shore or you can go upstate and you'll go wherever is open, frankly. I don't, I do not know. Uh, that's the mayor's program. So uh, I don't know uh, how he runs that. I do know we are all coordinating. Mike Bloomberg, former mayor of New York, is helping us with design and implement a tracing program because nobody has done this before. You know, we talk about it like it exists. Oh, we're putting together a tracing program. By the way, there is no tracing program. It's, you know, we've done it on a very small scale. This is a much, much different situation. And how do you trace uh, in New York City without coordinating with Westchester and Long Island and New Jersey? So uh, Mike Bloomberg and his philanthropy uh, really doing a great service. They're going to put together that tracing program on a regional basis because none of these lines work anymore. New York City, Nassau, Westchester, uh, the virus doesn't stop at a line. And that's not how our, our metropolitan region works anyway, right? I live in Westchester, still a resident in Westchester, work in New York City. So who's going to trace me, Westchester or New York City, right? Nassau commutes, Jersey commutes. So Mike Bloomberg is doing a regional coordination. Localities will still run their own program, and that's up to them. Governor, could you confirm that, that billions in new federal funding is making its way through the pipeline to the MTA? 
And could any of that money be used to increase homeless outreach in the subway system? You were just mentioning how this is an opportunity for contacts, but recent reporting has shown at Herald Square, for instance, that a lot of homeless are being engaged, forced out of the home, out of the subway system, but there's not any outreach workers actually on site. Yeah, the homeless outreach is a function done by the city. It's not. The MTA has. They have, they have funded, well, the MTA runs the trains and the buses. They're not a homeless provider, right? Uh, as far as funding for the MTA, you know, like, it, there is, I want to see the full funding package before I comment on it, and I'm going to have something to say about it tomorrow, because everything relies on federal funding, whether it's substance abuse, uh, education, I mean, right now, everything is dependent on federal funding. And I want, to, I want to make that clear for our congressional delegation. I cannot answer a question now as to any of these funding levels. If you said to me, how much are we going to fund schools? How much are we going to fund hospitals? How much are we going to fund substance abuse? I can't tell you. Because it's purely a function of what that federal government does. And my message to the federal government is, I understand that you wanted to take care of businesses, and I understand that you want to take care of airlines. Great. How about working people? Where are the police? Where are the firefighters? Where are the healthcare workers? Well, we need you as essential workers. You have to go put your life in danger, and you have to leave your house so we can stay home. Yay, applaud those people in the hospitals. Okay, where's the funding? Oh, there's no money. Just applause. You want to say thank you? Provide the funding, not just the applause. Is the announcement tomorrow um, in relation to the House Democratic uh, stimulus proposal? In relation to the overall federal need. Let's go to work. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.